I guess what's the conversation maybe been like with the, I guess, punch protection unit this week as you guys, uh, you know, try to get that fixed? Yeah, you know, the, the coach's point there is we got to do the simple better. Um, you know, two weeks in a row is unacceptable. Uh, again, it's, it's on me to, to get these guys ready, and right now we're, we're not ready. Um, uh, so, you know, we just got to continue to apply pressure and get these guys ready to roll. Early, what happened there? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you saw the play. Um, yeah, you, you just left early. The number one job in, in punt is, is to protect first. Right. Right. You protect first, then you go out and hunt. And uh, you know, we just got to do our job. It's a one. It's a one play. Um, it's a one. The NFL is one play. It's all about one play. It's not one season. It's not about one game. It's about one play. And uh, you know, we got to stop fighting those personal personal fights in between a game. Um, you know, that's that's what I emphasize to the team. It's one play. We got we got to bring it. Uh, you know, hit that reset button every play. Um, get ready to roll because right now we're not we're not doing that and it's it's not to the standard that uh, we need to be. Is the personal protector's job in addition to calling out the the snap? Is it also to try and be the last line of defense in case somebody does break through like that? Yeah, I mean right there they're rushing four guys. We we have plenty of guys to protect there, and I have the utmost confidence in our guys to protect in those one on one battles. Um, you know if we got our personal protector worrying about um, other person's jobs, then, then we got a problem. But um, yeah, we'll be all right. Kind of what you mean by fighting those personal fights in between plays? Yeah, it's, it's just, you, you know, there, there's there's little battles that go on. Um, you know, whether he's getting held up the first play, um, then he thinks he's got to get out. Um, but it, we, we got to protect first. We got to do our job first We try to, before we try to do something else. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with that. You have the utmost confidence in your guys to do the job. Twice, twice in eleven chances, they haven't done the job. What what gives you the utmost confidence? The, the way these guys prepare is, is unbelievable. Um, I, I like the guys in the, that, that we have, um, and I tell them that um, after it happened to Chestnut, I went up to him, you know, grabbed him by, around his, around his neck. I said, I, I said, I told him I believe in him. Um, no one took it harder than Julius, and I, I want to express that I still believe in him. I know the team still believes in him, and there's a reason why he's here. If Gibbons and Chestnut prepared phenomenally well, mm -hmm. then where's the where's the break in the failure to execute? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, we something something's falling in the cracks, right? And and that's you know my job is to figure out you know where it is. But the way these guys handle their business is, is second to none. And at the end of the day, it's, it's on me to get these guys ready. And you know whether it's applying more pressure, um, you know, giving these guys more looks. But as a team, we got to be better. It's unacceptable. Way that it has any kind of effect on Ryan just as far as his preparation technique and, and so, I, can you start, I, you're, I you're worried at all about it having any effect on Ryan uh, having punts blocked and back-to-back -back weeks as far as him carrying out his assignment and technique yeah no question I mean he's he's had a, a, a punt blocked in three of his last three games that's unacceptable and for him to say you know he's not worried is probably a lie um, you know he, he's one of those blocks really damaged his 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 knee, and so uh, we need to give him the confidence to execute his, his his job that we know he's capable of doing. And right now we're not, and uh, you know we got to get better. Evaluate Jaquan in the punt return game through two games, and what can he do to kind of? He, get he's going to continue to get better. I, I like you know what he's about to. Um, he's done a really good job handling handling the ball and, and uh, you know making good decisions. Uh, he's going to continue to get better. Um, you know being more aggressive to press the ball downhill. Um, you know, so he'll, he'll get he'll get better, and we like where he's at. What can you say to him to get more downhill? It seems like he does like going a little bit side to side sometimes. What I can say is just get downhill. You know, and you know that's something we've been repping, and um, just you know feeling the timing of that play, uh, a little different, I'm sure, than what he's used to in college. But he he's uh he's got to feel the timing and, and and the space that he has to to press it. Do you um? Do you fear that if something goes wrong a third time in three games that, uh, that, that your job could be in trouble? That's a great question. You know, I, I've, uh, I've been in this league 14 years um, as a player and a coach. And as a player, I thought my job was on the line every day. Um, you know, it's a privilege to, to work in the NFL as a, as a player and a coach. And, um, you know, for me, I, I like the pressure of, of knowing that it was based on my performance it's a performance-based league, and uh, you know, as a coach, I, I feel the same way. Um, I got to perform, just like you. You, you, you got to perform, and you know, create a story. That's that's how you get paid. And and for me, I got to perform as a coach to get these guys ready to go out and execute. And and right now, we're not doing that. So, um, I, I like the pressure. I I, I like um, 
you know, everything we're about, and I believe in the guys in that room, and I know we're going to get better. So I think Braden will be the kicker on Sunday. You forecast good things for him, I guess, in his career uh, after being with him for just a couple of months this offseason? Yeah, he's a great kid. He handled his business. He got better when he was here. Um, he did a good job for us and, and decided to see him on game day, but he'll have a good career. Brian talked about how he saw improvement from Will from week one to week two. What kind of things did you see that stood out to you that he got better at? I thought he did a better job taking completions. You know, I thought the whole offense played better as a whole. Uh, we were more efficient, you know, on first and second down. We kind of kept ourselves out of long yards, and he had a big hand in that. I thought, you know, he, his footwork was better. I thought his reads were better. You know, there's always things to improve, but I thought he was just calmer. I thought he played calmer than he did against Chicago, which was nice. How do you feel he's doing on this Working through his progressions if that first read isn't there. I think he's doing a good job. I think sometimes he goes too fast through them, too, you know? So I think there's a balance of – you know, you want to get so you want to you were through this route all week, or you really wanted to throw this route, and you think this is a look, and they don't win, and you hang on it too long. And there's other times where I think he's off it, boom, 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 boom. And so it just kind of comes with timing and playing in the position and playing as many live games as he can get, and you can't simulate those reps. So he's doing a good job. And I think there's some he wishes he had back. There's some we wish he had back. But then there's other ones where he gets through it. You know he kind of eliminates them pre-snap or something like that, and he gets through it really fast and gets to maybe number four or five in the progression, but he does it really fast, and that's those are good for us, too, to get the ball out. So, Eliminating them pre-snap, though, sometimes, can that be an issue? Like, can that cause a predetermined where he's going to go with the ball and then things shift after snap? For sure. Like, it's we want pre-snap recognition, so you always want to kind of give yourself a kind of like a tip Right, it's like okay, this is what I think this look is going to be, but it's all still post snap recognition, right? So defenses are doing a better job disguising, kind of giving their hold, you know, here everything about the too high shell, and so everything looks like too high right now, and then they move safeties later, then they come down and play man, and they play zero, and so you're always going to have a tell pre snap, but we don't want to totally eliminate somebody pre snap, and so I think if you get in the elimination game pre snap of all right, I'm done with this, I'm going to go over here, you're going to get yourself in trouble more often than not yesterday about learning to adjust to Will because he's got the strongest and hardest throws that he's ever tried to catch. Mm -hmm. Is that a real thing for receivers to have to adjust to a quarterback with the arm strength like Levis has? Absolutely. I think there's something, you know, he does throw it hard and he's, uh, I think when we first got here, he threw it really hard. And he was really trying to kind of just throw it through everybody. And he would always make up with timing with kind of ball speed. Right, so he'd be sitting there and he'd be waiting for it to come open and then try to make up for it by throwing it as hard as he could and beat the defender to the spot. So, you know, Will's done a nice job of kind of taking taking it off and sometimes he does kind of let it rip. Um, I'm trying to think of the rest of your question. But yeah, he's it, it is a real thing. And then the other thing of, with the ball, like if the nose is down, it's very, oh, I'm spilling water, now I'm that guy. Dang it, dang it, that guy. Uh, if the nose is down, it's really hard to catch too. So if you're a receiver and you throw it hard and the nose is down, then it's really hard. So kind of all those things of how he throws it and how the ball comes out is a, is a big thing. I appreciate the illustration. Thank you, exactly. <laughs> Try visual learner. Brian has said he needs to do a better job of getting DeAndre as the primary on more plays. The fact that DeAndre hasn't been the primary, do you attribute that more to like the knee? In time in camp, and why are we now at the point that we're comfortable making him the primary? Well, we're a progression based offense, so we always want to start, we always kind of give him a starting point. And we have a lot of formations, and so we do it that way. I would say Chicago, he had practiced, we didn't know how much he was going to be able to go. We really practiced a little bit on Wednesday, practiced some on Thursday, practiced Friday, and then was really. Friday afternoon, his knee was like, all right, I'm good to go. So it's hard to get him. You know, he had missed all the training camp for the most part. So then last week, we doubled his snap count, right? So he went from 15, I think, in the first game to 29 or 30 last game. And then there were ones where he was the primary. And like you're saying, with progressions, there's sometimes Will didn't get all the way through it and we could have got to him. And then there's other ones where maybe we eliminate him too fast. So I think it's just kind of a the passing game's all about timing, kind of repetition. And now that he's been out there for a couple weeks and his play count is going up, then I think it'll just kind of, we think it'll happen naturally, but we're also going to be intentful about it too. So long answer to kind of say, we think it'll all get there. 
put into simple terms why too high is giving people such fits in the NFL. I think as football fans, we're used to seeing two safeties on the field. Like, what makes it so much more complicated than what defenses used to do? I would say in too high, you were getting the two high shell at the pre snap. Now it just kind of hides everything. When they were in, the safety was down. You kind of knew where the who was going to buzz out, those kind of things. So when, you know, old Seattle three or kind of thing, you could pre snap, like we're saying, with the recognition. Now out of the two eye, just it hides everything. So it's more, there's more post snap recognition, which I think is harder. And then out of, you know, open coverage, they can match things. It used to be all kind of like spot drop zone, but now they're in middle open and they're matching it. And so they're carrying it. So it kind of plays out like man underneath. So I don't know if that's simpler terms, but. It still gives you a zone look, can play out like man, and that's then you need to have man routes that are on the run, but they've got all have vision on your guy. So you got to see the man defender and the zone defender. No, so, no, excuse me. Knowing that, how much more of an emphasis does that put on you, like the formation or personnel or use motion to try to get them out of that, that too high shell? Yeah, I think the motion thing has been what's big for us, really. We, we motion a lot. We, you know, we're moving guys in and out. We're kind of getting in tight formations and big formations. And so it's really making them adjust to us, right? Because then in those two high shell kind of match coverages, they have a million rules, right? So if two's tight, this guy's carrying it, if they're open, those kind of things. So for us to try to manipulate the rules is kind of now where it's going. Where, and that's where motion and shifting and kind of changing the formations really help us. Yesterday, Calvin said sometimes he runs his routes so fast he can't see. How <laughs> I didn't I missed that quote. <laughs> um, how do you make sure that you're using his speed as a strength and maybe not a weakness in that way with him going a little overboard? He is so fast that it's just kind of like it's one of those things. I, I don't know if you know how to control it, kind of deal, like a, as a coach. But we just you know you got to get it up early if. We're throwing a deep ball, it's got to get up earlier than it probably would for somebody that's not as fast as him, right? So those things down the field, you really have to play on time, right? So I think that was something in training camp as we were trying to get him, you know, some of those deep shots that we talked about and have talked about in here of, hey, maybe they weren't connecting. It really puts an emphasis on the quarterback to get the ball up at the right time. Because if not, it's a, if you're late to a deep ball, it's a 60 yard throw and, you know, the, Completion rate on that is fairly low, so um, I feel like that. I feel like I got you that, but if there's there's it. You know, we'd rather have them too fast than too slow. We'll take it. We'll take fast. Nick, do you think we're overstating the too high thing? It's the talk of the league the first two weeks, and statistically, we're seeing the uptick. But you guys coaching behind the scenes is that coming into play with the way that you're approaching the game plan? Yeah, we don't see it as kind of as big of a deal. I think the stats were surprising, but then I also think people are running the ball better. So I'd, we haven't totally gotten into it. We had some guys looking into it of it's too high. It's easier to run the ball, right? There's lighter boxes, things like that. So I think the running game has really improved because people have kind of abandoned the run here. And, it, you know, it's become such a passing league. Now it's if there's two I shell and there's only six guys in the box or sometimes five guys in the box, you should be able to run it better. So I think the running game kind of is the counterbalance to all the too high shell stuff. And when you when you emphasize that running game, you mm -hmm. have two backs like Tony Pollard and Ty J Spears. Spears specifically, uh, Brian yesterday doubled down on wanting to get him more snaps. Obviously, in that game, uh, he goes out with an injury. But how important is it to get both of that those guys going to see the full potential of this offense? Oh, it's vital. And you know, I think when he went out, it was uh, I think Tony had seven carries and Tajay had six or something like that. And then. We had gotten a Tajay screen. So they were pretty even when he went out. So that'd be the, that's obviously the plan going forward. And, you know, when he went out, it was uh, unfortunate, you know, where Tony really had to carry the load. But we want them to both be rolling. And, you know, when he's 100%, it'll be, uh, I think it'll be that way. From your perspective, oh. how, how much of the pressure stuff can be fixed with scheme tweaks versus how much of it is just one on one guys got to win battles? It's probably a balance, right? So, you always want to be able to help and kind of, you know, chip on the edges or slide to a certain guy. So we have some, we have plenty of that in the scheme, right? And we've been doing some of that, but like last year or last week, sorry, with the Jets, they get you in one-on-one -on -one rushes, right? That is their scheme. They're going to play man coverage and they're going to get you in one-on-one. -on -one. So you can only help so many guys, you know what I mean? And so I think there's part of scheming it up and we, we, 
done a decent job about it. We keep trying to emphasize it more and more, but they're going to get a, there's a one-on-one -on -one somewhere, you know, every snap. So we just got to win more of those. When you turned on the Green Bay defensive tape this week, what unit or maybe which player jumped off the screen for you? You know, the D line is, they're so deep, right? There's so many guys that can really rush the passer, right? They've, I would say six or seven guys that are interior and exterior pass rushers. So the fact that they're able to roll those guys and kind of keep them fresh, that's a, you know, a big challenge. You know, obviously Jair's a great corner. He's made a lot of plays on the ball. Uh, McKinney's had a really good impact coming back in and or joining them. And then, uh, you know, I've known Keyshawn Nixon a long time. I was with him at the Raiders and he's become a really good blitzer. So you see him kind of coming off the slot. So uh, those guys, and then the two backers are, they can run. So they don't really have a weakness or a, you know, a weakness at any level that you would say. So they're so balanced that it's been, um, it's a good challenge. With Nick last week, last week, obviously he had his struggles. This week with Sean Gary, like how much thought do you put into helping him with chips, with tight end, you know, those types of things? We would love to, you know, it's when the formation kind of, I don't think you can do it every play, you know, but we want to help both tackles. We want to help all our linemen would be, you know, number one. And then kind of every week in this league, everybody's got two edge players now. You know, it used to be when I think my first year in the league was 2012, there'd be like one pass rusher on a team. And you're like, all right, we just have to stop 92 over there. Now everybody's got five, six, seven guys. They can roll. They can move them around the formation. So, you know, even like with Quinn and Williams last week, they put him at the end on a couple spots. And the, the defensive coaches, they're not going to let their guys just kind of sit there and get chipped all day either. So they have kind of their answers. So it's that chess game. But we want to help those guys as much as we can. But I also think those guys can hold up too. There's, you know, Nick, I think he played decent at times. And then there's a place he'd want back. But um, I think we feel good about him. What was the big issue? I mean, nine pressures. You know, sometimes you just get, you know, I think sometimes he got bull rushed a little bit. Sometimes he's on his heels. You know, you got to, and you got to get your hands on him early, right? I think sometimes he's sitting there waiting. And if we're catching, and that's true of all linemen, right? If you're kind of playing on your heels, our pass pro is still an aggressive thing. I think that's kind of a, a misnomer of pass pro is this very passive kind of soft setting. You know, we're just going to set back and meet you at the spot. Like we, we want to be aggressive in pass pro and kind of be the, still be the bully a little bit in that too. So. Well, what's week like for you when you're not sure exactly who their quarterback's going to be on Sunday? Oh, we got to prepare for both quarterbacks. You know, obviously, um, you know, love, he's a hell of a quarterback in his league. He played, tremendous football last year and even the first week you know he was playing his tail off so you have to prepare for him being out there uh, the way they pass the ball spread it around you got to prepare, uh, prepare for Malik you know last week they came out and they ran the ball 50 times so you know we'll be ready for both okay in terms of our game plan and whoever comes out there we'll go out there and we'll compete to the best of our ability that have hurt you have been outside mm -hmm. and Josh Jacobs has had a lot of success uh, outside. How do you shore things up out there? Well, you know, there's been a huge emphasis on us uh, for us this week is setting the edge, you know, being violent, setting the edge. And, you know, we like to talk about setting the edge in between the midpoint. So in between the numbers and the hash, make the team run into a phone booth. And the guys, you know, they understand that it's, that's what that's our um, thought process this week, and that's those are the plays that's been hurting us, and we gotta goddamn put it, you know, put it into it. You got athletic guys like Ernest Jones and Kenneth Murray in the middle. How much more creative can you be defensively when you've got guys who can move around like that? Yeah, you can be creative. You know, those guys can play numerous spots. You know, they can play out in space. They can blitz. They can do a number, number of things. The big thing about them is they both run sideline to sideline. So you can be creative sending them. You can be creative in coverage. Um, you know, they, they add versatility to the defense. How much more difficult does it make, you know, with a lot of the misdirection and things that they did, especially last week, knowing you have your linebackers, they get downhill and play so aggressively? Well, it's really about your eyes. You know, a lot of the things they do is to buy your eyes. But if you, if you look at your keys, all right, whatever your key is, if you can count to, to three in terms of the count, in terms of who's number one, who's number two, and who's number three, and if where am I fitting off of that number, as long as I track that number, I'll find myself in the right gap. How do you think Ernest and Kenneth maybe complement each other leadership-wise and that they both have so much experience in that realm? Well, it's, uh, it's cool to see Ernest at this point. You know, when he first got here, he didn't know anybody. He was trying to figure it out. He was very quiet. Now he, he understands the defense. He's been around the guys. He's a guy that fits in, so his personality's coming out uh, more. 
Uh, Ernest is really laid back. You know, he's cerebral. Um, K-9 is the same way. Kenneth, he's the same way. But I think it's a yin to the yang because I think Ernest, Ernest has a very settling personality. And with him being in the middle, now we can allow K-9 just to go run and clean everything up. And um, I, think it's, I think it's a yin to a yang, and I think it's a good mix. I think it's good balance. The story after Sunday's game is creating turnovers. Mm -hmm. It's been a point of emphasis, but in some ways a little bit easier said than done mm -hmm. when quarterbacks don't put the ball in harm's way. So what kind of things practically do your guys have to do this week to be better at that? You know, the big thing we did, we went back to takeaway circuits. You know, normally an individual, every individual, every coach has – uh, individual drill that's used to take the ball away. But we overemphasize it, and we're overemphasizing it today. Um, you know, we're working on hammering the ball because a lot of times it's not a, just about the interceptions. It's when you get the sack, can you get the ball off the quarterback? When you run into the ball, you know, it's not always the first man there, but it's the second man that come, you know, being violent, punching the ball out. And one thing that we do well is run to the ball, and we swarm the ball, but now we have to finish and get the ball out. And, you know, if we do that, we take the ball away, you know, it sets up short fields and give us an opportunity to put points on the board. So that's a big emphasis for us. You saw Sneed travel a bit more mm -hmm. uh, this, this past week. How did that process go about? Like, did he come to you and tell you that he wanted to do it? Or did you go to him? Because I know you mentioned how, you know, that trust has to be yeah. there. Clearly well, it was. F like, for, for me, is when, when I'm looking at the past game and as coaches, when we're game planning, you know, you always have to know who you have to stop, right? And last week, you know, their running back and their receiver were two of the biggest players on their team. They're, those are guys that get the ball the most. And, you know, LJ's been a player throughout his career that can match up. And we we felt that it was advantageous to put him, you know, to number five last week and let him compete against him. But every week it changes. It depends on personnel. It depends on um, what we're doing from a coverage standpoint to take certain things away. And then, you know, as like I said last week, Cheeto's back and his legs are back. You know, he's had time on task. So we can line up and play left and right as well because I trust both corners. I trust Roger. And Roger's been playing his tail off. So, you know, I trust all the guys that's out there. So we can line up and just match up if we need to. Well, with him, as, as you've seen Snead, that is, as you've seen, you know, him in the regular season, his preparation and everything, how much do you like? Do you feel his intensity has gone up, or, or? yeah, he's a pit bull. Uh, he's um, and, and once again, he didn't have a lot of playing time since last year, as well. So the first two games is, you know, him getting his feet under himself again, and I think right now he's he's in a in a good place. I think he's in his bag, and it's time to turn it up even more. Your first year with him, and what, what maybe allowed him to have some early success? What I learned that Harold's a silent assassin. Harold doesn't say a lot, but he's extremely smart. He's really prideful. He takes everything he does on the football field extremely serious, and he wants to produce at a high level, not just because of him, but for his family and for his teammates. And, um, you know, every time that Harold gets an opportunity to go make a play, he makes it. I know you haven't been uh -huh. here last year, but one of the things that seemingly has changed about Roger is he's much stronger and better in run support. What's kind of been the key to that? His eyes. He looks at the right stuff now. In order to fit in the box, as long as you read your key and you trust what you're seeing, and, and, and if a guy blocks out and you know it's, it's run, you go to your gap. And right now he's playing with his eyes and he's playing ahead of motions and he's playing real settled, calm football. And uh, I love where he's at right now. Uh, Landry, like one of his sacks, mm -hmm. everybody went to Simmons. Mm -hmm. And you're not seeing Simmons like stuff the box score, but what can you say about like his importance and his contribution to, to this defense? I mean, when you look at Jeff, everybody makes their game plan around Jeff. All right, so Jeff always gets the slide. You know, he's going to get the double teams. Right now, Jeff's doing the dirty work. And, you know, one thing I love about Jeff and, and some of the sacks that Hurl has had, they have ran the games. You know, they communicated, Jeff communicated the game because of the way they were blocking. And Harold benefited from Jeff not being selfish. And I love Jeff and, and, and the way he goes about his work and not being a selfish player. And his time, his touches will come, okay? Because if he produces and, and, and Harold produces and Arden gets the touches and all the guys up front, all right, once they all get hot, who are you going to block? Okay, but all attention goes to Jeff right now, and rightfully so. He's a bad man. 
Just to follow up on that, they have the ability, like if they see something, they could go ahead and we have call certain, we, have, we have certain calls and certain rushes, you know, depending on what the front is doing, that they can game it up to make it make it benefit us. And, um, you know, Tracy Rocker, Ben Bloom, uh, they do a great job of coming up with the rush plan. And um, the guys, they go out there and try to execute it to the best of their ability. Attention element that's you're talking about. How does Tavondre play into this? Are you seeing more attention swing towards him, or is Jeff still the primary, primary Man, Jeff's still a bell cow right now. But as long as, as long as Sweat, you know, keep pressing the issue and keep showing that he can beat one-on-ones, you have to pay attention to him. And he'll earn the respect the, the more he plays. And then if you have to slide to him, how do you protect against Jeff on a one-on-one?